Well, good evening to everybody. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, on his, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'd like to preach about uh, the birth that changed the world. That's what I'm going to preach on. Now you can be seated. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of the word Christmas. Well, Christmas, it's a, uh, I guess a compound word of Christ in Mass, in Christ Mass, well, what's the Mass? Well, by Roman Catholic definition, it's a sacrifice that needs to be repeated every, uh, every time when they hold up their little wafer. That's why they call it a Mass. Uh, mass is not a Bible word, and it's, it's pretty much a massacre, when you think of it, as what's what they do every service, or a repeated sacrifice of Jesus. And, uh, and really, the, the words Christ in Mass have no business being together uh, because according to the Bible, he offered himself up one time, once for all, and forever, according to the book of Hebrews. And it's never to be repeated again. You don't have to continually sacrifice him. Now, the night that Jesus Christ was born, it was a time of great joy. It's a great announcement, as we're going to see, to all mankind. And I know he wasn't born on December 25th, but uh, you're thinking about his birth right now uh, because the world recognizes even the world, they recognize that this time is, you know, a time of Christ's birth. So I'll preach on it because it's, it's on your mind and it's, it's on my mind. I'm not going to preach out of an, exci uh, an, an encyclopedia. I'm not going to spend time going over the mistletoe and the Yule log and the Christmas tree and the gifts and the Christmas ham and all that. We went over that stuff last year. Uh, I just want to preach about Christ's birth because he was born, right? He was born. And, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. Let's look at that real quick. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. It starts off by saying, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now, it's the only genealogy. It's the only, it's, this is the only birth that can bring about life from this birth right here to dead sinners. The Bible says we're all born and dead, dead in trespasses and sin. And the only other time that that phrase is used, the generation of, it's used in the sense of Adam, the generation of Adam. And, uh, and you read gene uh, the genealogy of Adam, in Adam they all die, and in Christ they're all made alive. Okay, you won't find no death in this genealogy, in this lineage. Now, you can read through this lineage of people uh, from verses 2 to 11, and it has some really good men and women in this, in this lineage here. Some, some famous men, uh, spiritually speaking. You got men like Abraham, you got Isaac, you got Judah. You got Boaz, and some, then you got some good kings like Hezekiah and Josiah, uh, but but also has some pretty bad characters in it. You got Rahab, mentioned in verse number five. Uh, Rahab, she was known as, as throughout the whole Bible, Rahab the harlot. Uh, she, but look, she found her way in this genealogy. Then you got people like uh, Manasseh and Ahaz, who, who them guys they got rid of the Lord's furniture in the temple, and and they pretty much uh, brought, in, brought in a pagan altar. And that's how you find those guys. They ended up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to give you a warning that your genealogy is not an excuse for your life. Okay, that's, it's not an excuse. You could, you could come from a really bad, rebellious genealogy. You could come from a broken family, a family of rebels, and you could still amount to something for Jesus Christ in your life. Uh, so pretty much quit whining about what your... Uh, great grandfather great great grandfather did or what he didn't do or whatever and quit complaining that your mother was some harlot and cheated on your dad or whatever just grow up and and live your life for the lord jesus christ that's what you, what you can do so putting blame on your on your ancestry well that's not going to work when it comes to the judgment seat of christ you can't do that you can't you know you say well my great you know great great granddad he was a thief and he was a drunkard <laughs> okay he might have been he might have been that's whatever but how, how does that affect me? It doesn't affect me. Uh, if, if you're saved, I would assume everybody's in here saved by trusting in Jesus Christ. It shouldn't affect you. I'm a child of God. I'm saved, and, and I owe him 
my life. And so do you. So a good man, Hezekiah, we read about him. A good man, Hezekiah, he comes from a really bad man, uh, Ahaz. And even and then even a worse grandfather, Manasseh, who you read back there, lineage of Manasseh, had a good father. So uh, the, the point is that every sinner has to take responsibility for their own lives, right? Now, when Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, come to the book of Luke, it was a dark world of sin. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Kind of go hop around these passages a little bit. Luke chapter 2, back Matthew and Luke and stuff. Look at Luke chapter 2, starting verse number 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus, the governor, uh, was governor of Caesar uh, of, uh, of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary and his espoused wife, being great with child. So Augustus Caesar... Uh, decreed his empire to be taxed. And this guy, he had no concern for Jewish uh, prophecy. He had no concern for the Jewish people uh, or the Jewish prophets. He, he could care less about them. He was just trying to build his empire. So little, little did he know that uh, uh, as, a, as a lost man, he was fulfilling scripture. Uh, he was pretty much forcing Joseph and his pregnant wife Mary to go up to Bethlehem by the time she's ready to give birth. Well, what did they have to really go to Bethlehem for at the end of the day? Well, in Matthew or Micah, chapter five, if you're if you're not familiar with the book of Micah, uh, it, it this is a, a, a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. How it says, I'm not going to turn there. We should know by now, but it, how he was prophesied that out of he shall come forth a, a roller in Zion. This is a messianic passage, and it says where he's going to be born, Bethlehem Ephrata, just a little village that was prophesied hundreds of years before Christ was born. So the Lord, he uses a lost, filthy Roman Caesar to, to, to do it. And he got them back to, to Bethlehem. Now, another thing that's interesting about this passage is the, uh, the King James Bible is correct, of course. Uh, all those other versions, they're, they're wrong when it comes to this passage because the word is taxed. So it's an international, the whole world, the world is being taxed. It's an international tax. And I uh, looked up a couple other uh, translations, and they use things like census and regulation and one other weird word or whatever. But there's something to this. In Daniel 11, it shows that, uh, that the international raiser of taxes is coming again. It's going to come again, this international raise of taxes. It's going to come when the Antichrist does it. It says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, it says, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. So uh, the new versions, they, like I said, they come up with uh, uh, enrollment, registration, or census. And they're just, that reads the same as, a, as the, the Douay Reims Roman Catholic Bible. They're just trying to get rid of that word tax, which is something there, because the Antichrist is going to tax the world, just as this guy did. So you lose an, you lose an interesting cross-reference when you get rid of that word. And just as before the first coming of Jesus Christ, there was a world tax, an international tax. That thing's going to happen again. At the second coming, there's going to be this international tax by the Antichrist. So Joseph, okay, he had to travel with a pregnant wife, not by a car, not by a train, but pretty much over rocky terrain, riding on a mule. We had, that's how he had to travel. We had, he had to go by on, on foot, okay? So pretty much here, here's an attack on this baby before the baby was even born. Um, it, it's, it's an attack that's done in ignorance because he didn't know what he was doing. But uh, it's, it's an attack, and, and it's not done in ignorance by Satan. He's the one that was behind it. Uh, he, he knew what was going on, and he, what's, what's the devil after? He's after that seed. He's after, the, he's after Jesus Christ before he was even born. Because we read that way back in Genesis chapter 3 of that prophecy, you know, from her is going to, uh, a seed's going to come and it's going to bruise your head, Satan. That's what, that's what it pretty much says. And, and the, Lord's, the Lord, you read that, he said that right in front of Satan. 
And Satan heard that, and he, he knew that, and he knows the words of God. He pays attention to the words of God, and the devil, he tries to defy the word of God. That's what he does. And uh, he, pretty much the devil, he's saying, look, if this seed's going to bruise my head, if this is going to come to pass, then I better, I better pay attention behind the lookout for this promised seed to, to come about. And, uh, and he's going to go after this seed. That's what he did. The devil went after the seed all throughout the Bible. You could, you could read about stuff like that. So the devil, he has Augustus Caesar to declare some, uh, give this creed uh, about being taxed. And they make this journey all the way to Bethlehem. I mean, that's, probably, that's most likely trying to get, get her to lose that child on, on, on the journey. Uh, but, you know, it's amazing that the Lord uses the, the wrath of man to fulfill his word. That's one of the greatest proofs of the Bible. Yeah, the, the, it's the people that, that don't even claim to believe the Bible, don't even claim to acknowledge it at all, the Lord uses those people to fulfill scripture. That's one of the sure proofs of it. This isn't like, hey, let's all get together and our family get together and our family's going to fulfill it and we're all going to fulfill these prophecies to make it look like some big conspiratorial. People that don't even have no regard for the Bible fulfill prophecy. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's amazing. So keep your hand in Luke 2. Now, back in uh, Matthew chapter 2, I want to show you, here's the second attack right after he was born. So the first attack, him going up, getting taxed, going up, making that journey to Bethlehem. Then that was the first one before he was born. Now look at this. Here comes another one after he's born. Look at Matthew chapter 2. You kind of get the, the idea here. The, the picture here is that Herod's told by some, some wise men that, uh, here, that here comes, the, they're, they're coming to see this king that's born in Bethlehem. So look at verse number 16. These wise men say that to Herod and look what Herod does. Look at Matthew 2, 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. You know, you could even, I guess maybe you could infer that uh, uh, girls and boys maybe. I know it's guys, boys for sure. Went forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligi diligently inquired uh, of, of the wise men. So Herod, right off the bat, he unleashed his wrath towards our Savior. He, he, he unleashed it in pride. That's his pride. Nobody's going to take my throne. I'm the king of here. He did it in pride, and he was, he was concerned. I don't want no other king coming about and stuff like that. And, uh, so he, he must have thought of, thought of something of the word of God to, to go that far. And the, the word of God did prophesy that a star should come forth out of Jacob. We'll see that later on. And uh, in, in, the, in the wise men, they saw that star and they went to it. And I just, just imagine the, the sorrow that was going on in, in, in Bethlehem. In that, little, in that little old village, you had mothers, I mean, weeping, crying, because they're getting their children tore apart from them. Little babies, kids, and they're getting killed like that. You know, just killed. Two years and younger. Uh, hundreds of families, they, they lost their babies that night. In the world, the, 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 in the world, in history, they called this man Herod the Great. <laughs> what a great guy out there killing babies. You know? Herod the Great. Like, then the, Luke chapter 2, look at verse number, uh, back to Luke, Luke chapter 2. Let's look at verse number 6, Luke chapter 2. To be taxed with Mary, verse 5, his espoused wife being great with child. And, it was, and, it, and so it was that while they were there, they, they, uh, the days they accomplished that she should be delivered. Just in time. Taxed, go to Bethlehem, they're fulfilling prophecy, right? Then verse uh, 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for him. In the end. Now, the first part about the verse, obviously, is that she brought forth her firstborn son. So, uh, what, does, what does firstborn mean? It means before others. He's the firstborn. Okay, that's, that's the, you, you know what the Bible teaches. It teaches that Mary did have other children. She was not a perpetual virgin. Mary was a good wife. Mary was a good, a good woman. She was a good mother. Uh, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with the Mary of the Bible. Don't misunderstand me. You know, maybe we take such a, a hard approach against Mary. There's nothing wrong with the Mary of the Bible at all. As a matter of fact, she's a blessed woman. She is. 
But if we have something against the, the, the Mary of Catholicism. That Mary, she's straight up demonic. That, that is a, that's a Mary that's right out of hell. That's, they're different. Okay? Uh, if, if you want to turn there, if you haven't seen this before, but Matthew chapter 13, verse number 55. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, it says this. It says, is, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not, is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, four brothers, and his sisters? Christ had sisters after the virgin birth, his sisters. So what? there's at least two of them, right? And uh, they're not all with us. Whence hath this man all these things? Okay, so Mary and Joseph, after the virgin birth, had at least four boys, uh, two girls. Okay, there are six other children. Well, then you add that, you add the Lord Jesus Christ, there's seven, so that's, a, that's a, always a good number, right? Now, let's look at, look at Luke chapter 2 again. Luke chapter 2. Okay, so she brought forth her firstborn son. Then look at this. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes. All right, swaddling clothes like how you would wrap a, wrap a corpse up. Uh, well, why, did he, why, why swaddling clothes? Because... Because he was born to die. He came to die. And uh, only two men in the Bible uh, that, that, are, that are both named Joseph carried the body of Jesus Christ. You have Joseph, his father, being there, carried Jesus out of the womb. And then you have a guy, Joseph of, of Arimathea. He carried his body to the tomb. It just it has a good ring to it. Joseph and Joseph are the only ones that carry the Lord Jesus Christ. So she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And then says, and laid him in a manger. Here's the reason. Because there was no room for them in the inn. There was no room for them. So you, you talk about condescending, coming down, descending. Uh, the, the God of glory, the creator of the entire universe, uh, the, the great I am, sitting on the throne of heaven, he comes down and he's in, this, he's in a manger uh, with, with, with animals and, and filth. And well, why? He did that for us. He came down and left glory, come down in a, in a manger for us. That's what he did it for. And uh, he came down to a, to a world that has no room for him and uh, still has no room for him. And he's born in a, in a place of all places that's called Bethlehem, which that word means uh, the house of bread. So we read about in John chapter 6, Jesus Christ says, I'm the bread of life. So, uh, the, you know, when the, when the bread of life really comes down to heaven, and he, he shows up in the house of bread, Bethlehem. These people still have no room for him. So uh, I'm not going to blame the, uh, the innkeeper. You know, guy, he's probably just trying to make some money. You know, he's just an innkeeper. I'm not really going to blame him. He don't really know what he's doing. He doesn't know that God Almighty is about to come in, out of all places, to come into my motel, my hotel, and uh, we don't got room for it. <laughs> If I was a hotel guy and I knew that thing, I'd say, some of you got to go, get out of here. God Almighty is taking the best room in, the, in my inn, okay? But what are things? You know, it said that uh, there was no room for him. And it just, it, this just kind of shows you in type, I believe, that, that the world has no room for Jesus. To this day, they still have no room for him. And uh, it's just, they, they just they push him out. They get him out of here. You go out and go to the barn. Go to the manger. Uh, so it's, it's something. The, the light of the world, he was born in darkness, in the darkness of night. And uh, the, the light of the world, he dies in darkness. At right, his death. You read that in Luke chapter uh, 23. This is speaking of the crucifixion. He says that it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was rent in midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father... Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said, uh, having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So ain't that something? He was born in the, in, the, in the darkness of night. He died in the darkness. There was darkness over the earth. And that was interesting during the daytime too. But died in darkness. He was, he was born in a manger between animals. Well, we go back to Psalms chapter 22, the crucifixion passage. And we see that he died in the midst of a bunch of animals. Psalm 22 says the, the bulls of Bashan... Uh, uh, were round about me, dogs encompassed me. Now I understand there's a spiritual thing there too going on, that, that bulls and 
dogs. I could refer to spirits and, and men even. Men are likened unto dogs or likened unto... I mean, you ever know some people that are likened unto animals? <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sure we all do. We know some people that just live like a dog, you know, but there's something there. Born in the midst of animals, died in the midst of animals. So, and then at, and then at his birth, he was, he was praised by three wise men that gave, them, that gave baby Jesus three gifts. Well, in his death, he was mocked by, uh, I don't know, three or a couple of them. He was, he was mocked by foolish men, okay, who also gave, gave Jesus three phony gifts, uh, if you want to say that. In Matthew chapter 26, if you want to look at these real quick, look at the three gifts that these uh, scoffers, these mockers gave him. Matthew chapter 26, look at verse number 27. Matthew 26, look at verse number 27. Um, hold on. Uh, Matthew, how about Matthew 28? Next one, Matthew 27. Matthew 28. Matthew 26. Verse number 27, let me see. Okay, it's Matthew 27, 27. Matthew 27. Look at verse number 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. There's one. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, there's two, they put it on his head. And a reed in his right hand, there's three. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So you got three phony gifts from these band of soldiers. I don't know how many were doing it. Probably maybe even three. Who knows? So at his birth, he was, he was hailed as, as king. Okay? And, and then at his death, he was hailed as king, except they were mocking him. One was genuine. One was, one was a fake. One was phony. Another thing is about the similarity with that is one of the gifts was, uh, that was given was myrrh from one of the wise men. So myrrh was given in his birth, and then myrrh was also given at his death. It says in John chapter 19, there came Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight, and they took the body of Jesus, wound it in linen, clothed with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So then you see myrrh shows up at his death. Now, those gifts that the, those three wise men gave they all had meaning behind it. Those three gifts, you know, one of them was gold. And the gold represented, it represented uh, like kingship, okay? It represents his deity. This little child, this, this the gold, all the, fat, the furniture, the tabernacles laid out in gold, represents, you know, deity, God. This is God coming in. That's gold. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. Then another one of those gifts was frankincense. And you read about frankincense in the Bible, that represents worship. Okay, so you, you read about those, uh, that that's, that's, has something to do with uh, his priesthood. Like the, all the Levitical priests in the Old Testament, they had uh, frankincense. They'd go in and that was part of the, their priestly duties in the tabernacle. Read about frankincense in the Bible. It has something to do with his priesthood. Then you got myrrh, and that represents in the Bible uh, uh, death and mourning. So that would represent his office of a prophet. All them prophets, Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, uh, you read about it, and you know, Jesus says, haven't you not killed the prophets like your fathers did? You killed, you killed the prophets back in the Old Testament, you're going to do the same thing to me. So Jesus Christ fulfilled three offices in the Bible. He was a king, there's the gold. He was a priest, there's your frankincense. And he was a prophet, there's your myrrh. So there's a little sim symbolism of, of, of them gifts. So come back to Luke 8. So when the Lord was born in that manger, you know, you talk about, just a step down. You know, you, you can't get any lower than that. You, you, you can't get any more of a vast difference from the two places of Christ up in heaven to Christ down here on earth, uh, born without room, without a room in a manger. You know, there's, a, there's another little one that, that rhymes. He was born without a room, and guess what? He was also born without a tomb. The guy didn't even have his own tomb to bury himself. He had to borrow a tomb 
from Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph gave him his tomb. He didn't have a room. He didn't have a tomb. I mean, you know, that's that's uh, he condescends and is born into a, into a, the world as a poor person, and he 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 sets all his glory aside for us. That's amazing. That's amazing. He didn't come down and you know just worship me. I'm just like he, he really humbled himself. Took upon the form of a servant. Humbled himself, being obedient. Uh, he learned obedience. <laughs> I, I still I, I could explain to you, you know, all powerful God. But yet he has the power to limit himself. All-knowing God, yet he has the power to limit his knowledge. <laughs> and he has to learn things. That's, that's beyond my, my comprehension, uh, things like that. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the, 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 glo the, the God of glory, look at, verse number, look at verse number 8. Let's look at this. Look at verse number 8 real quick. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. <laughs> Where, where's like the fanfare? And where's like the, the, the gun salutes and the, and the parades? And the, uh, and the, where's, where's, the, where's the liquor at? Where's the drugs? Where's the pot? Where's any of the stuff? Where's the big deal? Where's the parades of, of, of a miraculous birth, a fantastic birth has, has just happened? And, uh, you know, you read stories about that, like kings. Uh, when a king would have a son, uh, into the royal family that would inherit the, his throne, they'd have these big deals, these big banquets. They'd shoot off uh, 100 cannon rounds and stuff like that because they had a son born into the royal lineage. Uh, fireworks and all that stuff. But the Lord Jesus Christ is introduced to a bunch of nobodies, <laughs> just, a, just, a, just a bunch of poor, lonely shepherds out there in the field. And that, that encourages a, a nobody like me. It really does, you know, and... I, I believe we have kind of a tendency to think that, uh, you know, I, I could I could only if I could only be holy, if if uh, if I could just get rid of the daily grind of working and just spend time alone all the time. And no, your what I see is your holiness is going to be found in your daily grind of life, so to say. And uh, you know the that's there's 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 something there. Maybe, maybe that there's those shepherds, one of them. I don't know. Maybe he might have said to the other shepherds, look, I don't feel like coming into work today. I'm just going to call it a night. I'm going to relax and lay down. And he would have missed it. He would have missed the biggest announcement in history, the world's greatest birth. He would have missed something. So, you know what? You, you know, you could miss something if you're not supposed to be where you need to be. You could miss something doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's where your holiness comes from. It doesn't come from you going out and I'm going to go to some monastery. I'm going to forget about the whole world. I'm just going to, then I'm finally going to, you know, get in touch with, with God and stuff. No, it comes from your busyness in, in, in your daily grind of life where uh, that's what the Lord does. That's who he calls. You see that in the Bible. He calls faithful men who are, who are busy doing what they're supposed to be doing. You see that in, in David. David gets anointed when he's tending sheep, tending the flock. David gets called. Elijah, he gets anointed. He gets the mantle of Elijah when he's over there plow in the field. Uh, the, the shepherds are out in the field that night and they got, they got a holy chorus from angels. You know, what a night that that, that was. And then you got Peter and, and Andrew. Uh, they were fishing. The Lord calls them and says, come over here, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. They're working, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you got people, uh, you had um, James and John's, what were they doing? Uh, they were mending their nets. Just a bunch of guys fishing, fixing holes in a net. <laughs> And uh, just in the daily grind, and they were just doing what they were supposed to be doing, and that's when they were called during that time. So that's pretty much the best place that you can be in your in your life is where you're supposed to be. That's when you're going to hear from God. Uh, the Lord always meets men and women where they're supposed to be, and uh, and you know it's not in some religious retreat or something like that where you, you think you're going to hear more from God. That's not it. You're here. You're here from God swinging a hammer. You're here. You're here from God. Laying a laying a cinder block. You're here from God cutting the grass. You're here from God doing, I don't know, bussing tables. You know, whatever you guys do, that's when you're going to hear from God. That's where your true holiness is found in your daily life. You don't got to be no monk and just uh, you know go to some monastery or nothing like that. That's that's not it at all. You hear him in the factory, wherever your job is. You hear him at your crazy restaurant, whatever. I mean, I don't know what. What people are doing, but that's when God speaks. That's when He should. You got to be where you're supposed to be. 
Look at Luke chapter 2, look at verse number 9. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Look at that. Imagine a guy that wanted to call out work that day would have missed this. What a, what a thing. Tending the flock at night, night shift. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. I'd be scared to death too. What, what, no, what, a, what a night. What a night to see such a, such a thing like this. The sky lit up. It lit up over that field because why? Because the light of the world has come into the world. I am the light. It lit up. Okay, Jesus Christ was born at night, but when, when this announcement showed, came off, it was like daytime, you know, and he died. It was daytime, but what a tragic thing to happen in the universe. It was just like nighttime. I mean, this is, this is something. The Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Look at this, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to circle it all people, which shall be to all people. Now, you know, I know, I know today or coming up, was, this was not when Christ was born. Most likely Christ was born sometime in the fall time. We should have been singing all these songs in September if we might want to be accurate. Maybe that'll be pretty weird, you know. Imagine some visitors coming in and we're up here singing Silent Night in September, you know. I mean, I, you know, I, this is, maybe it's just true. Maybe we could do that and just throw things off a little bit. But uh, most likely he was born sometime in the fall. I believe we did a study on this before. We, ch we studied the genealogies and the, uh, in the course of Abihu and John the Baptist's dad and uh, shepherds in their night. We, we looked at that before, but uh, it's probably in around the time of the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was when God come down and wanted to tabernacle with man. The Word became flesh, tabernacle, you know, hang out with, with become flesh and stuff. But look, either way, I'm, I'm glad, <laughs> okay? It's, it's, a, it's a joyous day to think about Him coming down to save us. It is. Uh, because if, if he didn't come down, you and I wouldn't be here today. We surely wouldn't be saved today. What in the world would I be here sitting by trying to preach a book? To, where would we be here? Where, I don't know where we would be. Probably out messing around or doing something stupid and foolish and living like a bunch of idiots and stuff. We wouldn't be here We're right now today at this moment if it wasn't for the, the greatest birth the world ever saw here right here. This is, it's a joyous day. It's a day of, it says, a, a, a great joy. Now, he's also called, he's Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God comes down to be with us. And if you're ever going to find God or have God revealed to you, it's only going to be through Jesus Christ. That's it. It's not going to be the, through your way or my way or this way or that way or whatever. It's, it, it's, there's not many roads to God. There's only one. The Lord Jesus Christ made it clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said that. Don't, don't come at me. That's what he said. Okay, so take it up with him if you don't like that. You know, it says good tidings and great joy. You find me one verse in the, in the Quran talking about great tidings and great joy, <laughs> you're not going to find it. You're not going to find one verse in the Quran talks about great joy brought by from Allah or nothing. There's nothing in there but just rolls and laws and swords and, and bloodshed and there's no, there's no peace. There's no joy. There's no salvation. There's no Emmanuel, God with us. Where's the joy? It's, there's nothing in it. And uh, the, the, I smell a stink bug in here. Does anybody smell, anybody smell that? I got, a, I got a nose for them things. They smell like cilantro to me. Don't, don't they? Anyway, um, the, the, about that joy, you don't find joy in the Quran. You don't find the, the, the Greece and the Romans and the pagan religions. You, they, you know, they, they, tried to, uh, they tried to find joy. And to all their followers of the, of, the, of the paganism religion, they said, yeah, the way to find joy is just go out and fulfill the lusts of your flesh. Do whatever you want to do, whatever feels good, whatever pleases you. Go out and live like a dog, live like a heathen, and just indulge. And there's your hedonism. There's your, there's your uh, thing. And guess what, guess what happens? It ends in dissipation. It fades away. It ends in depression. There's no, there's, it ends in a, a still a void, something that's missing. It ends, there's no joy. There's no actual true joy. And you can have a little, a little pleasure and a little fun, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't end there. 
it doesn't bring great joy, especially when you're about to die. You live like a heathenist or like Voltaire or one of them philosophers, and then, then at their deathbed, they're thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, what did I do? Because you lived your life like a heathen your whole life, and then finally at your deathbed, you don't got no peace. You don't got no assurance. It might be all right a little bit in your life. It's going to wreak havoc in your life too, but definitely don't help it uh, when you die. So the joy of the, of the Christian life, it's, it's not some fake party smile, uh, some, you know, you know, look how happy I am type of thing. It, that's, it's not it. It's, it's, it's great joy. It's, something, it's not some uh, temporary attempt uh, uh, at trying to be positive all the time. It's just, it's just an underlying thing of the Christian life is that you have to have, you ought to have great joy. Uh, we have good days. We've got bad days. And uh, we have stuff go wrong in our, in, our, in our lives and things like that. But underneath all that, we actually have a message of great joy and good tidings. Okay, We've got a life of joy. That's the Christian life. And, and, and sinners, they, we can only find that joy that's in Jesus Christ. Okay, And, and I, I found joy. <laughs> And I, and I I found out that uh, that I couldn't meet all the demands of God's law. I can't meet those things. That that law that law told me that thou shalt not lie. I lied. There's one right there. I broke one of them. Who, who, who cares about the rest of them? You already broke one of them right there. You lied. And that law says thou shalt not thou shalt not steal. You stolen. You know you did all kinds of things against God's law. And and when you found out, you know, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law he took my place for me that ought to brought you some great joy and that moment that had to bring a great joy you know and and, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you what else that gives me great joy is that i don't have to serve sin anymore i have a choice now i don't have to serve sin in my flesh when i was lost that's all i can do i had no other opportunity i had no other choice and, and if you think okay well you know you had a choice and i was just trying to do it to please myself, trying to turn over some new leaf or trying to make me feel better about myself from trying to do good deeds if I ever wanted to do one and things like that. That was just me trying to feel better about myself. There was no joy uh, as, a, as a lost man. There was no peace when you were lost. You didn't have none of that. In, in peace with God, when you have peace with God, it does bring you great joy. Peace with God. In the, the birth of Jesus Christ, it, it, brought, it brought praises they were, uh, uh, they're out there shining around about and behold, to bring you good times of great joy. The, the, it's a, it's a, another verse. It's, a, it's like the angels are singing. There's a chorus of angels and things like that. That's a, that's a blessing. It is. And uh, at the birth of Jesus Christ, that, that's worship. Uh, and and this, this announcement is made to all mankind. It's available to all. It's, it's available to whosoever. <laughs> It's not just available to your elect whom God chose from the foundation of the world or something like that. No, it's, it's there to all. It's up, it's, what are you going to do for them? We got, we got freedom to live for God, freedom to live a good life. And I just think, you know, when I think of my, my Christian life just for the past five years, I think of them five years compared to, let's say, 15 years. Okay, I'm, let's not count when I'm a little kid or whatever. I didn't know what anything was, but... Just as a kid, you know, I look at them 15 years lost. That's just like a, that's a groan. There's no great, there's no great joy of, of being in darkness, scratching around, trying, to, trying to, to, to find reason and purpose. Nothing. Just empty. No joy. Compared to, my, to, compared to the five years that I'm going on being, being saved, what joy, right? Now look at, uh, look at, look at Luke chapter 2, verse number 11 here. Look at this one. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Uh, and, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And here goes the thing. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, "Glory to God in the highest, on earth goodwill, uh, on earth peace, goodwill to men." Uh, it's amazing. What a scene! So, what a place to be born! What a humble, a humble beginning, a humble beginning that ends in, in a glorious role when He rules and reigns the earth for one thousand years. Uh, the manger, 
about that manger, it's, a, it's pretty much a despicable place for our Savior to be born. It's filthy. It's dirty. Uh, it, it stinks. It's, but it's a great picture of something. That manger is a great picture of our hearts. <laughs> dirty, filthy, despicable. It stinks. Desperately wicked. I mean, that's, and, and yet, doesn't the Lord say, I want to come into your heart? He does. He, he, I want to come into your heart. Just, and, and, and our heart's a pretty dirty place. And, but when he comes in, he, he, start, he helps us. He tries to help us clean it up. And I know there, there are sinners out there that uh, say, that I, I, just, I just can't have him in my heart. I'm too dirty. I've done too many wicked things in my life. He, he just can't come in. I'm too, I'm too filthy. Well, he came into a place like a manger. If he come into a place like a manger, he'll come into your heart. And, 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 and uh, that's, a, that's a, one of the mysteries uh, of, uh, of, that Paul talks about. The manger took them, so therefore you can take them. In a manger, that's a place for an animal. And he was there. So that same thing could be said about our hearts, okay? And that manger, it, the, just the manger had room for him. So that, there's, the, there's a good question to ask you all is, do, do you have room for him? So we talked about last week, loving the Lord, our God. Do you have room for him? Sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Set apart. Give him time. Is, is there room in your heart? So that's the, the, the question to any sinner out there. It's not that, uh, you know, uh, you know the, are, you, are you worthy or something? You're not worthy enough. That's not what it's about. Just the question is, do you have room for him? Will you come and allow him to, to come in? That's, that's the real question. The innkeeper, the, innkeep, the innkeeper said there's no room for him. All the houses over there in Bethlehem and that whole little village, there's no room for him. But somewhere over in that little back on the backside of some barn over there, there's a manger over there. He can go over there, go, go born in that thing over there. But the manger had room for him. And you see the billionaires of today and the kings and queens of today and the, the politicians of today and all that. They, today, they don't have no room for Jesus Christ. They could care less about him. Uh, but yet, every one of them is going gonna, is gonna to bow their knee one day to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to they're gonna make room for him. They, they're going to. Um, and that's, I know, you ask, just ask any stranger what he thinks about the Lord Jesus Christ. They lift their nose up at him. They, they don't, they don't, most of them don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like nothing's changed uh, at all. Um, and, and right now, you know, he doesn't demand you to give him glory. He doesn't demand you worship him, but he will one day. He will. Every knee shall bow. There's no choice there. Every knee shall bow. So if you want forgiveness, the Bible says you must be born again. And um, so that's just, that's just something to think of. Come to, come to Matthew chapter 2 here. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And I remember when I was first presented with the Lord Jesus, I, I didn't want him. I turned him away. And the Bible says you could turn him away if, if you want to. But you know, some, this thing about Christmas time, this is sweet. You know, we sing these Christmas songs and we sing the, think about the birth and they'll sing the lullabies and things like that. But he's not coming back as a baby anymore. He's not, he, he didn't just stay a baby. You know, it's like it's all people, they get, just know about him as a baby. He, don't, he, he grew up all right. He, you're going to be surprised. Comes back, he parts the universe, splits the universe, comes back riding on a white horse, many crowns, many crowns. Eyes flame as fire, white robe coming back down. What a what a transformation. Look at Matthew chapter two. Okay, Matthew chapter two, look at verse number one. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where where, where is it he that was born where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. And are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem uh, with him. All right, he was troubled. He at the things what? At the things found in Scripture. Okay, and then look at verse four. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he gets his Bible scholars and stuff, you know, together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. You tell me where Christ is born, you prophets and priests. Where where is he born? And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written of the prophet. And he guess what? They quote, he quotes Micah. He quotes that verse that we started on. You know, uh, 
in Bethlehem, out the least among princes of Judah, for out of these the governor shall he shall rule my people in Israel. So verses, uh, uh, that right there, they knew right away. Now if you compare that with uh, the Gospel of John, if you have time real quick to go there, John chapter 7, they spit it out right away. All right, Where, Where's Christ born? They knew it right away. He's born in Bethlehem. Well then you look at this story over here in, in John chapter 7. Look at this. Now that he's born, this is what, 30 years later? Entering into his public ministry? Look at John chapter 7. I know they remembered what that, what that story was. The star came, Herod killing babies. That's a big time in history. It just happened 30 years ago. You know, babies getting killed, star in heaven. They've seen these signs. Remember these, these, these people from Persia, Babylon, wherever they came from? They come into our town looking for this king and stuff. And uh, In Bethlehem, they knew that. Look at John chapter 7. Look at verse number uh, 21. Um, John chapter uh, 7, um, verse number, man, I don't know, I keep writing down the wrong verse. It's, which the one where it says, uh, how be it we know this man whence he is? Um, here, verse number 27, I'm sorry, verse 27. How be it we know, uh, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. <laughs> What a bunch of liars. You know, now, now, now when Christ comes, they played stupid. Well, we don't know where he's going to come. Nobody knows. Well, he's just going to show up, the Messiah. Yet 30 years ago, they could, them, pro, them scribes and prophets, they knew exactly where he was born. So uh, they, they, uh, they lied. They, they, just, they just didn't want him to be their Messiah. They just did not want the Lord Jesus Christ. They envied him is, what, is why they, they delivered him up. Now come back to Matthew chapter 2. Let's look at the, the, the manger scene here. Okay, we're getting a little, uh, getting a little bit older here now. Look at Matthew chapter two. Look at verse number uh, uh, seven. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent to them to Bethlehem and said, "Go and search diligently for the young child. He's not a not a babe, but a young child. And when you have found him." Bring me word again that I may come to worship him also. What a liar. He wanted to kill him. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which, uh, which they saw, uh, uh, saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over the young, where the young child was. So that's interesting. You know, before we read in Luke, it was all about Mary and the babe. You know, the babe, the babe. Now it's about this young child. Now look at verse number 10. When they saw the star... They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were, uh, notice they had great joy too, right out, right out of the gate. When they, when they were coming to the house, right, not the manger, but a house now. This is year, a little bit, a couple years later. So he probably at least two years old, maybe. That's why Herod said, killing them kids up to two years old. Because by the time it had passed, these guys were coming to us. You fi he figured it had to be about, he had to be about two years old now, okay. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child and his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And they opened up treasures. They presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and, and, uh, and myrrh. Okay? So, you know, this, this, I hate to uh, spoil your nativity scene with all the shepherds. And the shepherds are there. The wise men are there. Frosty the snowman's there. Santa's there. Rudolph's there. The whole gang's there. Everybody's there. I hate to spoil that picture, but no. They're different events. In the manger, just the shepherds were there. You go up in the house, now the wise men show up. Two different, two different events, okay? Now, uh, we'll, we'll look at verse number 12. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country uh, another way. Okay, so they, these men, they were called the wise men. They were wise. What were they doing? Were they into paganism and think no these they were wise because they searched the scriptures daily the fear of the lord bringeth wisdom uh you know it, it it stimulates you they were searching the scriptures that's why they were wise and they saw something in the old testament come to the book of numbers look at numbers 24 and because you know they were doing what they were supposed to be doing like we are searching the scriptures 
right? God revealed to these wise men something. Well, look what he revealed to them. Matthew chapter 24, or Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24, look at verse number 17. Look at Numbers 24. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not, uh, but not nigh. Uh, there shall come a star, capital S even, a star, out of Jacob. That's Israel, Jacob, Israel. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And now look at this. And shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of, of, of uh, Seth. Well, ain't that something? Now this, here's, here's a, a prime importance of why we have to rightly divide. So you see, the, here comes a star, okay, a star, that's first coming. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab. Well, that's, that's second coming. So they're, they're, all these commas in that verse literally separates 2,000 years. Star, first coming, smiting people, coming back with vengeance, the second coming. You have to, we have to rightly divide our, our Bible, okay? And, uh, and, and Balaam, I believe he's the guy that, that's uh, given that prophecy, um, he, he doesn't know that, okay? And nor does any Old Testament Jew know that what was going on there. Now we know it because we're in the New Testament. We're on the other side of things looking back. But it says a star shall come out of Jacob. Come to Daniel real quick. We're just going to touch upon this briefly. Daniel, book of Daniel. Um, a star shall come out of Jacob. So those, those wise men, they sure were, they were wise, I mean, I wonder how much how much time they spent in the scriptures and figuring this stuff out. Because look at this, look at Daniel chapter. Uh, I don't got the reference down, but uh, notices what they were going after. We're not going to get too crazy with this stuff. But look at Daniel chapter nine real quick. Daniel nine verse number twenty four. Okay, Daniel nine twenty four. Eleven fifty four. One of the meatiest passages in all the scripture. Look at Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, God's people, Israel, and upon thy holy city, not deep Washington, D.C., but this is Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, okay, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Sounds like Calvary. Sounds like the first coming. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, okay, that sounds like the millennium, even beyond that, even beyond a thousand-year reign. His kingdom is forever and ever, right? That's what the Bible says too. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Most likely Christ was anointed at the baptism when the, when the dove descended upon him, the Holy Ghost. That's probably his anointing there. Uh, know therefore and, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem un, unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score in two weeks. So a score that's 20, 40, 60, uh, 60 in two weeks, that's 62. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Might have a future application. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. He has to die. Okay? But not for himself. Christ didn't die for himself. He's dying for the people. He, he wasn't a sinner. He had to die for the people. But then, and the people of the prince shall come, destroy the city, the sanctuary then shall be of a flood. The next thing you know, verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many with one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And with the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even the consummation, and go on and on with that. Now, this is, you have to be wise. You have to search the scriptures to even understand what in the world is going on here, Okay. Uh, that star came out of Jacob, and those wise men, they started looking for that star right around the dates that Daniel gave. Number one, is this, this is a prophetical week, so that makes it even harder. This isn't just literally 70 weeks. There are 70 weeks, which equivalent to years and, or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it comes out to be 490 years, and uh, at, at, at 483 years, the Messiah would be cut off. 
It, this, this passage tells you when the Messiah would come. This is the book of Daniel, probably written around a Babylonian time, Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar, wise men probably, there's probably a big deal to them, they probably you know, read a lot about this. So they knew, okay, if, he, if Messiah's going to get cut off at 483 years, he had to show up sometime around 480 years after the prophecy of Daniel was given, okay? And uh, those, <laughs> that's tough, but those wise men must have understood Daniel's 70th week. Um, Bible scholars to this day still have trouble with this, and even our, like, you know, talked about last week, even our own camp of King James Bible-believing Baptist Christians and stuff like that, they're still fighting about the remaining time on Daniel's 70th week. Is it, you know, I, I still believe that there's still a week has to be fulfilled. There's a week left, which is seven years. In the midst of the years, the things broken and stuff like that, I'm still going to teach it's seven years. Uh, because imagine this, though. Imagine if I go around now teaching three and a half years, and some brethren get lost in the church, and they remember, yeah, he's preaching three and a half years. Then all of a sudden they go, they get left behind at the rapture, and they think, I'm going to endure the end, I'm going to do what I can. I got three and a half years, next thing you know, I got another three, the three and a half years, the son of perdition shows up, they're going to think it's Christ. I don't know. I'm going to just probably play it safe. It's, say it's seven years. <laughs> all right? Either way, I'm gone out of here. We don't got to worry about all that stuff. But the point is, those wise men, they were wise because they searched the scriptures. And then and, and they, were, they were looking up at the stars. the stars. The stars are for signs. You could read about that in, uh, in, in Genesis and things like that. The, so the, come to Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 24. So the first coming, there were signs in the heaven. A star appeared. And then wise men are searching the scriptures. They got that Daniel 70th week. They got it cracked down. They know, they know exactly when the Messiah is coming. That's amazing. I mean, that's such a meaty passage of scripture. But the Lord revealed it to them. So first coming signs show up in heaven. Well, look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. The second coming there will be signs in the heaven. And, and the Bible also says over in Paul, he tells you, he says it clear as day, for the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. I don't require a sign to believe or nothing. I want, we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't need no signs. Paul talks about the times and seasons, but we don't got to get carried away with, you know, astrology and the gospel and the stars and Vertigo is aligning over here, and vertigo is opening up, and it's giving forth a baby. And yeah, that may be true, but I don't got time to look into all that star stuff. I mean, that you know, what's another one? The the blood moons and the shemitas and all that. I don't, I don't really care about that stuff. I mean, it might be interesting, okay, to a Jewish person, and go ahead, do it, and all that. But Paul don't talk about that stuff to a New Testament doctrine, you know, to the to all the churches, or else he would really have mention that stuff if it was that crucial but look at here though look at Matthew chapter 24 verse number 29 how about this one Matthew 24 29 the words of Jesus Christ he says this immediately after the tribulation of those days after the tribulation after that seven year period of those days shall the sun be darkened the moon shall not give her light the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That's quite the earthquake. I mean, that's shaking, uh, that's shaking the atmosphere and that's shaking the outer space. That's quite, the, that's quite a shake. And then, I don't know what they call it, quasar or quark. <laughs> Scientists are studying, you know, quarks and, and quasars and stuff. Look at verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and, all, and, and shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds with power and great glory. What a difference. First coming, I come to bring you glad tidings and great joy. Second coming, people are signs in the heaven. They're mourning. They're wailing because they, they rejected him. And they come and see him in a way that <laughs> wish you would have saw him the first time, how, how he came up. But that's, uh, that's something. And we're going to be caught up out of here before that, but... The Jews, they're going to be reading the signs or reading the scriptures. They're going to be just like the wise men. They're going to be looking for signs in the heaven. Uh, here's, a, here's a good little poem. Uh, the, the foul manger became his crib. The cattle became his company. An old towel became his bib. Despise him not for lying there. Consider from whence he came. 
The darling seated in heaven's chair comes to poverty and shame. With penitent heart approach this king, no longer a little babe, whose praises the vaults of heaven ring of Jesus who came to save. That's a blessing. Now, I realize that, that Bethlehem, it leads to Calvary. And he was, he was born in a manger. He went from a stable to a cross. He came to die. And, and this little babe, the young child of Matthew 2, he grew up to be a man. Now he's king of kings and lord of lords. And he, uh, I'll just look at Revelation real quick. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 19. Come to Revelation chapter 19 real quick. And uh, he come down, he was a man, he, and he suffered loss for you. And he, uh, he uh, you know, for us, a fallen, uh, fallen sinners. Now, I realize that there's, a, there's great, you know, commercialization of Christmas. And that's something that, you know, I don't, it's nice. What, I mean, okay, you know, I, back in the day, I probably used to say, I ain't giving gifts on Christmas. Pagan. You know, I was stingy. I didn't want to buy no gifts. <laughs> that was my motive. <laughs> to cheapskate. I ain't buying no people gifts. It's pagan. Trying to act like I was Mr. Holy and stuff like that, which is horrible. <laughs> horrible. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, there's a commercialization of, in Christmas time. Okay, there is. And, and I, obviously, I know what's behind it. The Bible gives me the answer. It's the love of money. You know, we're getting, we're getting gifts for everybody and walking out the line and, oh, I need that. I'm about to check out. Oh, I need that. Oh, I could get them that. That sounds good. And just all this commercialization type of stuff, you know, and that's, it, it, it's, it's sad. That's, it's, it's for the season, it gets messed up. It's, it's not the reason he came. No, the reason of the season. That's not why he came. He come to die for us. You know, he, he come to, Paul doesn't say it any better. We should have looked there real quick. You probably know it. It tells you why he came. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Period. You know, I love that. That's, that's why he came. Okay. And uh, Revelation 19, Revelation 19, we'll go verse number uh, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's him coming at the second coming. Look at verse, look at verse number 15. Or, uh, yeah, verse number 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. He shall roll them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the wine, he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He come to reign, he come to make war, he coming to fix this mess. That's what he's coming back for. And I'm glad he came. I'm thankful he came. He saved me. And, uh, and you know, let me just tell you a little something of a personal testimony. If I want to sum it up, give me a good, just a short testimony. It gives me great joy in good tidings. It's, it's, it's great joy. He didn't give me, a, uh, he didn't give me a, a, like a black robe. You know, that's like for funerals and stuff. That's like for mourning type of stuff. But you read throughout the book of Revelation, it talks about a, a white robe. He gives us a white robe that's associated with righteousness. And we get his righteousness. He didn't, he didn't give me no black robe of, 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 of gloominess or doom. or not. He gave me a white robe of his righteousness. So... Just want to close back on Luke chapter 2, verse number 10. I like that verse a lot. Stuck out. That'll be our verse memorization. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 2. So the question is, I want to end it off, is do you got any joy? Do you got any joy? Are you, are you glad that you're saved? Um, look what it says here in Luke chapter 10, or Luke chapter 2, verse number 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. We got no fear of going to hell. I ain't walking on eggshells no more because I'm I, trying to do what I think I can do to get my way to heaven. I know, I know my name's written there because of what he did for me. I trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection, called upon him, took him as my Lord and Savior. So therefore, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of, of great joy, which shall be to all people. So there's the offer. Jesus Christ, he gives an offer. Um, don't, don't get any more clearer than that. Uh, let's just let's bow our heads. Let's let's go to the Lord in prayer for a little while. <clears throat> I like that to all people. That's like I said. That's not just to a selective few, but to all that will receive His payment. All right, Father, we just we thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you for the night.
in Bethlehem, uh, that he was willing, willingly left uh, the glories of heaven to be born of a virgin, uh, to such a humbling beginning, to be laid in a manger with animals, to live a life out that I couldn't live, never committing a single sin, and satisfying all the demands of the law, and uh, shedding your blood, Lord, on that cross to wash away my sins. It's so personal, Lord. I'm so thankful for that, Lord. And um, if there be any uh, sinner that has never come to Jesus Christ by faith, Lord, anybody that's listening, I just pray, Lord, that you show them their condition. Yeah, show them, Lord, the severity of sin uh, in, the, an eternal, in eternity in hell, away from you, Lord, forever. And I pray, Lord, that they take advantage, uh, advantage of the opportunity of your mercy while it's still extended. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, that they invite you in and, and make room for you, Lord, in a, in a world that has, it seems to have no room for you, so busy, so crowded, too much noise, and you came on that silent night, Lord, and I just, uh, what, a, what a blessing, Lord, that manger had room for you, and our hearts should have room for you, Lord, and um, for those of us, Lord, that are, that are saved, just um, may we use this world, but not abuse it, like Paul says, and may we Use this time to, to tell others how Christ came and born in a manger and swaddling clothes and uh, such a cute little picture and beautiful picture, but you came to die for sinners. I pray, Lord, that we bring that, that message to other people uh, during this time, get out some uh, as many gospel tracts as we can, uh, and uh, just talk about uh, just our joy, the great joy that you brought us, Lord, the joy found in a Christian life, Lord. Thank you for bringing, uh, giving us just purpose and just a reason for breathing, a reason to be alive. As Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And uh, we just did that, Lord, and so thankful. And we just give you all the praise, glory, and honor. Help us be, help us be wise in these times. Help us to search the scriptures and just... Uh, May we present our, we don't got no gifts to give to you right now, but Lord, we, you're after more than that, and I pray, Lord, we present our bodies to you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we'll do Luke chapter 2, verse number 10. Bible, first memorization. <clears throat> 